The in-between is one of the biggest mysteries on the Dream SMP today, and in this video I'm going to be putting forth my theory on what exactly the in-between is, who controls the in-between, and also talking about the other side. Want to know more? Keep watching. Alright, so let's establish a bit of a base so we know what exactly we're working with here. If you already know everything there is to know about the Tales from the SMP and the in-between, feel free to skip to this timestamp. For those of you who are staying, hey! Also, Carl Jacobs has a series on his Twitch channel called Tales from the SMP, where he portrays one canon story from start to finish in every stream. These stories either take place in the past or the future as compared to the normal SMP storyline, and the reason that this is possible is because, canonically, Carl is a time traveller. Now, hold up, I know what you're thinking. Time travel, that's overpowered. How has Carl not completely taken over the server yet? And that's a good question. But you see, the main catch with Carl's time traveling is that he can't control when he time travels, what time period he travels to, or even how long he spends in those time periods. And this will be important, so keep it in mind for later. Alright, so Carl is time traveling, that's all cool. What's this in between thing then? In very simple terms, the in-between is a gateway, a middle ground that Carl travels through every single time he time travels. We don't know much about it, but someone, presumably the people who control it, talks to Carl every single time he visits the in-between via books. We know that there's something going on here because of the more recent streams, but those are the basics all covered, so let's get into this theory, shall we? What is the in-between? That's the main question that this theory wants to answer. Well. Here you go. There has to be a middle ground. Time traveling is crazy, it goes against the fundamental way the universe functions. A time traveler, however powerful they might be, can't easily combat the fundamental rules that govern, well, everyone else. There has to be a middle ground for these travelers so that instead of breaking the universe's fundamental laws and then going straight back to a place, or rather a time with those rules, they're traveling to a place outside of time. A place that isn't governed by the same rules as everywhere else, or even every when else. A place that's, as I'm calling it, timeless. Time travelers, or just travelers as I'm calling them from now on, use this middle ground to rest and regroup before traveling on back to their own timeline, and in this sense it acts like a gateway. For every single timeline there's a different traveler, a different person who got the power to access the gateway, and thereby to access their timelines past and future, and every single traveler is from a different timeline, one where things went differently in some way, big or small. An egg wasn't thrown, a walk wasn't taken. A disc wasn't found. Some big, some small. And here's where the first major assumption of this theory comes in. The in-between never used to be the gateway for travellers. No, I think that a different place was the default gateway for travellers and that only, for want of a better word, recently that the in-between started getting used by travellers. The default gateway, in my opinion, was what we now know as the other side. Now, I didn't cover this in the recap, but the other side is basically another dimension that Carl got to through a portal while running away from something in the in-between. We don't know much about the other side, but from a few visual clues, I've got a pretty solid explanation as to what the other side actually is. So, if we know there's something, or someone, controlling the in-between, who, or rather, what controls the other side? Well, let's take a look at the place itself, shall we? The first thing we can see from the other side segment that we currently have is that the castle is externally black with a red glow emanating from inside, as if something red is on the inside, controlling it. Next, we see a wide assortment of nether-related items, from netherrack to lava to polished blackstone bricks, all being part of the castle or the surrounding terrain. So we've got something red and which has strong connections to nether-related blocks. I think you can see where I'm going with this. The final nail in the coffin for me, however, is what really sealed the deal on this theory, is these tendril-like structures. Tendrils which all seem to emanate and grow from one place, or one thing, since they seem to be alive. You know what I'm talking about here. I think the other side is controlled by the egg. Now, I would explain the entire lore of the egg to you, but that's a whole other can of worms, so we won't be getting into that here. All you need to know for this theory is that the egg is a crimson red infection-like entity that can mind control people and seemingly is alive. When we give it a bit more thought though, the egg being the controller of the other side makes a lot of sense. Because you see, we've seen the egg being directly linked to time travelling, or at least a time traveller, before. 
In The Masquerade, which was one of the first tales from the SMP, Carl found that Sir Billiam, or Technoblade, the owner of a massive mansion, was being mind controlled by the egg and, quite curiously, actually saw the egg inside said mansion. After this interaction, after being directly involved with the egg, this was the first time that Carl was able to consciously experience himself being in the in-between, although it's been confirmed that he went there a few times before when time travelling, so remember this for later, yeah? Now we know that the egg was there, fully developed and even partially dormant, hundreds of years before the current SMP storyline, so it's not too much of a stretch to assume, then, that the egg has been around forever and will be around forever. It's directly connected to time travel and so it's present in every single timeline from the very beginning, ready to direct and guide travellers and to keep them safe. Because you see, I don't think the egg itself has the power to time travel, oh no. I think that travellers and the egg have a symbiotic relationship of sorts. The egg protects travellers wherever and whenever they go, using its powers of brainwashing and mind control to keep the travellers safe. In return, the egg gains the power from the time travellers to stay healthy and thriving for more time than should be physically possible by using part of the power of the travellers. This raises the question then, why did the egg tell Billiam to kill Carl during the masquerade? Well, I have an explanation for that, but we're gonna have to circle back to it, so keep watching. Okay, so we know the egg controls the other side, which was the default gateway for all travellers until the in-between popped up. So, what's the deal with the in-between itself then? For this, I want to take a closer look at the idea of colours and what they represent on the SMP. Carl's signature colour, the one colour which screams Carl, is the colour purple. We also know that Carl uses portals, like the nether portal in the in-between, to travel between timeless lands, lands which, for the most part, can only be accessed by travellers. I think it's safe to say then that the ability to time travel, that power that's an innate part of Carl, is symbolised by the colour purple. We also know that the egg's signature colour is red, as is pretty evident from the blood vines. Now basic colour paint mixing things will tell you that purple is made up of two colours, red and blue. We also know that as Carl is time travelling, there are two main factors that he needs to do so safely. The safety and protection of the egg, and the memory or mental fidelity to remember his journey and document it later. So we have time travelling, which is purple, and the egg, which is red, being part of it. There are two characters on the SMP associated with memory loss, and only one of them is untouched by any other higher power on the SMP. Ghostbird. And what's Ghostbird's signature catchphrase? The one he uses to try and provide people with calmness and to ease their mind. Sad, but have some blue, please. Calm oh, yourself. thank you calm for the blue. Yourself. Have some blue, calm yourself. I, I'm me. on. That's right. Blue. All right, so we've established the importance of colors as symbolism for powers, or at least travelers on the SMP. Great. What next? Well, I want to take another look at the in-between, or more specifically, the color scheme of the in-between. There's one colour, or I should say, one shade, that's predominant in the between, dominating almost the entire build. White. Pure, blinding white, bleached of any colour, any semblance of expression. Colour which, as we know, symbolises powers, memory, time travel, all gone in the in-between. I think it's pretty well accepted now that the in-between isn't as pure and happy as it first seems, and that there's definitely something sinister going on there, and this colour observation only seems to hammer that assumption in even further. So here's what I think is going on. A group of nefarious entities, and they are a group as we see from this we in this book, created the in-between to try and sap the power of every single traveller from every single timeline to use for their own purposes. Unlike the egg, which only used a small amount of the traveller's power, keeping them reasonably stable and in control, the in-betweeners are trying to take as much power as they possibly can from every single traveller. They're sapping them dry of the colour, the essence that makes them special, hence the white colour scheme of the castle. Those colourless alabaster walls, the blinding white light that permeates the entire castle isn't from the in-between itself. It's being directly extracted from Carl. I think the in-between is set up by the in-betweeners to try and intercept travellers who would have otherwise gone to the other side and to keep them there, in the in-between, for as long as possible, to keep them on the path so that their power can be taken. The clones of Carl that are seen running around in the in-between are other travellers who stayed in the castle for too long and ended up losing themselves, losing every shed of individuality and power that they once had. 
the second a new host arrives, the second someone with power and colour and form of their own, in this case Carl, shows up, these husks of old travellers latch onto and leech off of that form, desperately trying to fill in the vacuum inside them that the in-between hollowed out. That's why they look exactly like Carl, that's why they haven't got a mind of their own, that's why, even when Carl sees the castle as dark and dingy as it actually is, they're still wearing white. They have no colour of their own, just like the castle has no light without the essence of Carl. A quick side note here, but there's a very clever metatextual clue to the actual power level of these entities hidden in the books that they write to Carl. Well, I say hidden, but I think you probably know what it is. This smiley face. Smiley faces have only been used by one person, or should I say demigod, on the server before, and that's Dream. Dream, as we now know, is a god, but that's only because he got extra power, because he got that extra push. But even before this incident, he had abnormal levels of power. He could talk in Ranbu's head, or at least put a manifestation of himself in there, and that was the power he had from being a demigod. The j Schlatt bulk was what pushed him over the boundary, finally ridding him of his immortal status. But he had power before that, and he used smileys while he did so. You know who else uses smileys? That's right. The Inbetweeners, a group of people who have the abnormal power required to create a place that's beyond the confines of time and who are desperately seeking more power, but we'll get to that in a second. The way travellers are transported to the Inbetween is also just directly shown to us by Carl, as you can see here from the other side. There is a massive rift, a tear, a gaping portal present above the other side, and I think that this was created by the Inbetweeners and is used to siphon travellers to them. There are just two problems that this raised for the in-betweeners. One, every portal has a counterpart, a door that swings the other way, an escape, a way back. And that is the portal that Carl uses to get the other side here. And two, if you're creating a portal directly above the enemy base, which only leads into your land, well, the enemy can get in as well. And that, dear viewer, is why Carl kept finding books and safe houses and was able to break free from the illusions that the in-between cast over him, because the egg was trying to rescue him. Not out of any concern for or care for Carl, but because it was losing power. It needs travellers to stay alive, and the in-between was taking them from the egg. That's why the first time Carl wasn't completely brainwashed, the first time he had some control in the in-between, which is designed to take it from him, that first time came directly after he met the egg, remember, from earlier. The in-between would love to try and keep travellers docile and on the path for as long as possible because that means that they can take more and more power from them with every visit. The egg wants to stop this and, as weird as it sounds, it's sort of the good side in this situation. It's directly tied to life and growth and tendrils. The in-between has wither roses which actually kill you above their books, whereas the other side has white tulips, symbolizing the tiny amount of power that is taken from travelers. That, in short, is the reason you can see the books that the egg places are generally near trees or near plants or near fire, the only form of light that isn't blinding white that is empowered by Carl in the in-between. That's why Carl had to follow torches to get to the portal rather than end rods. They're yellow light, not white light. They have their own colour. They're not sapped from another's essence. The egg is thwarted regularly, make no mistake. The safe house under the tree was found and destroyed, leaving behind the red blood-like essence of the egg as the only mark on outside influence. This is the reason the egg told Billiam to kill Carl in the masquerade. Since Carl hadn't experienced the in-between yet, to the egg, he would have looked like a time traveller completely controlled by the in-between. And obviously, the egg would try to get rid of him as fast as possible. There's one more crucial factor that we're missing here though, and that's the motivation for the in-betweeners. Why do they need all this power? Surely they wouldn't go to all this trouble for nothing, right? What's the reason? Well, the reason lies right back at square one. The stories. The tales from the SMP are canon. They're real stories from the actual timeline of the SMP, which Carl documents and writes down and keeps safe in his library. The main goal of the in-betweeners, the main reason they want more power, is so they can finally eradicate the other site, so they can finally destroy the portal back to that land. They can't go through it themselves because to do so would be to expose themselves to the egg and its mind-controlling powers, and they can't get rid of the portal outright without the power to do so. 
That's why they insist so heavily that Carl tell no one of the in-between that he keep it a secret, because if he tells people in his time about it, there's a chance that the egg, which is also present in his time, learns of the in-between and starts attacking it from there, or giving Carl another way to the other side, another way to time travel, which the in-between can't block. So, once they finally do get that power, once the egg is gone, once the other side is out of the equation, the in-betweeners will control the travellers completely, and more importantly, will control the travellers' libraries. You see, I think that every single traveller from every single timeline has a library of their own, which they fill up with documentation and knowledge of past, present, and future. The reason the in-betweeners are fine with, no, encourage Carl to time time travel more and more, even though he doesn't have any control over it, isn't just because they want him to keep coming back. It's because they want him to keep expanding his knowledge of his timeline and what will happen in it. Because then, the in-betweeners would also control that knowledge. By removing the other side from the equation, the in-betweeners would make Carl dependent on them to time travel, and therefore would have access to all of his stories, all of his knowledge, and more importantly, his library at all times. And this would scale up massively and apply to every single traveller. With that kind of knowledge into the future, cross-referenced with immense knowledge of the past, you could predict, well, anything. You could see the future, you could see exactly how every scenario would play out. It would be like having the script for the SMP right there, neatly documented and illustrated in a library, to open whenever you wanted. That kind of knowledge, that kind of power, it would make you godlike, unable to be harmed in any way. Always four parallel universes, or should I say timelines, ahead of your enemies. That's the goal for the in-betweeners, to shun whatever mortality they have left, and to gain absolute power over everything. Past, present, and future. Or at least, that's my theory. Thanks for watching.